Kurt Ames. I am the CEO and Creative Director at Stumbling Cat, which is my own studio. I also do random contract jobs and other things. And I'm here to talk to you today about preventing abuse in VR. And I'm going to first explain what abuse is, why I consider abuse, and then we'll really dig into it. But first, uh, let's talk a bit about myself. So as I said, I'm the CEO and Creative Director of Stumbling Cat. It's a small indie based studio that I formed uh, based here in Seattle. I am also on the Seattle chapter board of IGBA, and just two months ago, I was elected to the national board of directors, um, so I'm very honored for that. I, uh, I work part-time as a producer at Hashbank Games, and then I advise students uh, in AR and VR development at Foundry 10, which was founded by Dave Newell and his wife. It is a nonprofit alternative learning uh, center where they both study and um, teach students. And then I am a... VR developer, consultant, and enthusiast. I mean, it's hard not to get excited about virtual reality. So, let's talk about what abuse is. So, uh, in the dictionary and in VR, I'd like to think that there are two types of potential abuse. One is using something to a bad effect. I would consider this like abuse of trust. So this is abuse that can come from the content, from the creator. You are abusing your users by maybe not informing them, maybe taking advantage of their trust, that's a type of abuse. The other type of abuse is, is more harassment, cruelty. This is abuse that you often see in between your users, especially if you're in a social VR environment. So here's an example, uh, potentially, of the first type of abuse. So this is a woman playing a virtual reality game and becoming so terrified that she forgets that she is in an environment outside of virtual reality as well. Now, Perhaps she was consenting to this, you know, perhaps she was expecting it, and she loves the thrill of being really scared. But that might not be the case. Maybe she wasn't informed. Now, there is a risk when you're working to prevent abuse, abuse from content, abuse from other users. And uh, I think our goal should be to allow uh, the full extent of virtual reality to be appreciated while reducing and preventing abuse. Because you don't want to limit someone's experiences in VR for fear that one of them might be bad. I mean, obviously, we do not want people to be subjected to bad, uh, traumatic uh, experiences, but we also want to allow them to do what they would like to do in those VR environments, especially between consenting friends and adults. Now, to prevent abuse uh, from content, uh, especially as content creators in virtual reality, I like to consider uh, the rule I call ICE which is first inform your users. Inform them if there's going to be a jump scare, inform them if there's going to be um, something really graphic. You know, this is also a lot like ESRB ratings, except for virtual reality is super um, convincing. You get uh, really a sense that you're there and those things are happening to you. So when violence in a video game might be terrifying uh, by itself, violence in VR makes you feel like you might be being actually physically attacked. So you should inform your user that that kind of content's in there. You should also consider what type of content, uh, what kind of situations might be traumatic to your user. And you know, hopefully inform them before time, but at least take those into consideration in your development. Now, you obviously can't consider everything. You know, people have uh, phobias that are less common than others. Uh, for example, I know of a person who was showing their coworkers virtual reality. And they were using a demo called Blue. And if you've ever heard of Blue, it's a, it's a very beautiful demo where you get to experience marine landscapes uh, you know, from the first person's perspective in virtual reality. Now, one of these scenes is sort of standing on a sunken ship, and a great whale comes up to you and sort of swims by. And it's really an amazing experience. You get to see how large this whale is. You feel like you're really there. And when he was showing one of his coworkers this, he didn't know that his coworker had a phobia of whales. And this ended up being an utterly terrifying situation for the guy. And he broke out in a cold sweat, you know, he all the color drained out of his face. But luckily he had people watching him, they were able to remove him from that experience. Now, I'm not saying that you have to tell everyone that there's whales or kittens or spiders coming up in your uh, virtual reality game or experience, but it is good to consider things that might be, you know, really traumatic and and you try to approach those in a way to reduce any trauma. Now, finally, I think it's very important to remind your users that they can escape from any situation. 
uh, aims at warning users, hey, you know, you can do this to pause the game, or you can take off your headset at any point in time. I'm not saying that you have to build in, you know, really advanced tools to prevent uh, content from continuing when the user wants it to stop. I'm just saying that you should, you know, inform your user about different options to escape from your virtual reality content if it is too intense for them. A really good example of this uh, that is not as explicitly implemented is there is a virtual reality game where you're being attacked by zombies and they come at you. But if you ever look down at the ground, all the zombies stop. They stop putting that pressure on you. You don't get overrun. It, it, it sees you expressing fear, and it modifies itself properly. It helps you escape from the situation. Now, there are other games, um, such as social uh, VR interactions, where you can make a gesture to you know, put yourself in a bubble and not see anyone else in the VR room. And that can help you remove yourself immediately from those uncomfortable situations. Now, that is a really big problem about social VR, is that, that these experiences are so convincing and so real that when someone invades your space in virtual reality, it feels like they're invading your space you know, in reality, in person. So here's an example quote from someone who experienced something like that. So there's a lot of benefits of social interaction and virtual reality. It gives people freedom uh, to you know, meet with their friends from around the world. It gives people freedom to put themselves in social situations where they might not normally be comfortable or you know, they might not normally be able to engage with those. However, it also sets up the potential for people to be really abusive. And when all they have to do is log offline and escape from it, it's hard to, to prevent it. And so that's what I'm going to do, talk about uh, for the next few minutes, about ways to help prevent this kind of harassment in between users, ways to help foster a good community where that harassment is reduced, less common, um, but still allow your players to interact as they, as they like with each other, as they consent to with each other. So first, there are you know, a lot of tools for prevention. And I think the strongest, most powerful, and easiest element tools are uh, personal moderation tools. These are tools that a user can use to modify their experience in the moment. Now, enforced space is a really good tool. That is basically giving yourself a bubble of interaction that you're, a bubble that you're preventing interaction within. This is your personal bubble. Um, if you implement it, I'd recommend having different settings to it, so if someone's more comfortable with people being close to them, they can create a smaller bubble. If they prefer people to stay uh, farther away, they can prevent, uh, create a larger bubble. And, you know, this might be just uh, putting other users' objects and arms and such into that space. I've also seen uh, issues where, before this was implemented and then was implemented later, uh, you could teleport into a user's bubble. And there's nothing more startling than having someone suddenly appear right in your face. Um, so there's a lot of different ways uh, that this personal space can be implemented and should be considered. Uh, also, in regards to personal moderation tools, I think there should be tools for interactions between users. A way to quickly uh, reduce the interactions between a particularly harassing uh, user or a user you just don't want to interact with. So muting them so you can't hear them, uh, turning them invisible, or just ignoring invites and interactions from them. Yeah, and these are really basic moderation tools that are often present in uh, online and multiplayer games, and they have their space in the VR world as well. Now, I noticed with our badges here, uh, at least I, I missed the explanation of these, but I assume that these are interaction level badges. And those can interact or work really well in virtual reality as well. It gives a way for a user to quickly modify their uh, comfort and what they want to interact with in their space. So, you know, a green badge would be like, I'm okay with everyone interacting with me, and I'm, you know, I'm happy to get invites from anyone, and be with games with anyone, hear anyone talk, see anyone move. Uh, and then you, know, you can do a yellow badge, where it's like, I'm only okay with my friends interacting with me, or I'm only okay engaging with users that I engage with first. And finally, you know, the sort of the red badge level is like, no, I don't really want to act with anyone, interact with anyone today. Uh, I woke up with a bad hangover, and I really just don't want to see anyone else right now. Um, and what's really great about this system is it's so easy to switch. You don't have to worry with, about changing a lot of settings. You know, if you wake up feeling groggy and you don't want to interact with people, but then you're feeling more social, you can up your level from red to yellow, yellow or red to green. 
And this allows a lot of flexibility for the user in regards to how they're feeling in that moment. And I think that's really powerful. All right, so more tools. Uh, community moderation. Community moderation is really powerful, especially for helping establish an initial culture uh, that admonishes abuse. Um, moderators are very helpful because if you take outstanding members of your community that are, you know, supporting the culture that you want within your community um, and that you know are respectful, those people can be almost like additional. Uh, you know, community leaders for you. And so having moderators, especially in large VR uh, social games, can be really helpful. Uh, another way to help with community moderation is to have designated rooms. Now, this can be implemented in a number of ways. You know, I, I've been discussed with clients in the past about this being implemented on kind of a karma-based system where you have uh, almost like different rankings of karma. So if other users downvote you because you know, you've been really mean, you haven't been listening to people, you've been really abusive, that you get put in lower karma rooms where you interact with other people who, you know, have been uh, showing the same behavior. Or these can be set rooms. Uh, you have rooms where all the interaction is family friendly, or all the interaction uh, allowed includes, you know, 18 plus, you know, rated R interactions. Also, when you have designated rooms like this, they start to pick up their own cultures. And so they get their own reputations. You know, you might have seen in first-person shooter games, certain servers get certain reputations. In World of Warcraft, you know, you have your designated role-playing servers, and those servers themselves have uh, reputations deeper than that. It allows for people to sort of pick their own culture and put themselves in the environment that they feel most comfortable in. Now, uh, and I, I mentioned the karma system when I was talking about the designated rooms initially. And then finally, I at least would recommend for uh, VR platforms, consider platform-wide uh, moderation. And this simply means that if you have a user who's super abusive and gets banned from multiple games and continues to do so, to consider giving them a temporary ban or even a permanent ban on the platform itself to prevent them from hopping around and continuing a, you know, a system of abuse and, and hopefully allow them to reflect on you know, why they're being removed from the communities and improve upon themselves. So, with these tools, you know, there's also risk of abuse of the tools themselves. You can get people, especially if you have like a karma-based system, to get their friends together and gang up on some person and all down the vote them for no particular reason, other than to, you know, harass that user. Um, this can also be used to, to abuse uh, matchmaking systems. So if a user is to block another competitive user because they don't want to play against them competitively, you know, that's a risk. You have to consider this. You have to consider what kind of game you're making, if it needs this competition, if users should be able to block each other. Um, Overwatch, which is a first-person shooter game that came out by Blizzard, when they were running their beta for their game, they allowed users to say that they didn't want to play against certain players anymore. Now, this was to prevent you know, abuse in between users. It was to say, hey, this guy's not fun to play with, this guy makes me feel uncomfortable, I don't want to see them again. People abused it where they said, that guy's too good, I don't want to play with that person again. Certain users who were really abusing the system ended up not being able to get into any matches because they banned everyone who else was playing with them. So they had a bad experience because they were waiting, you know, 20 minutes to get into a game, and it was because they abused the moderation tools. Um, we have to consider that. And then... Finally, I think it's important to consider if you want to punish your users for acting poorly or if you want to rehabilitate them. I think your approach there will be different. I think if you want to rehabilitate a user, what you should do is try to get them to reflect on why they might be receiving their punishment or why they need to change their behavior at all. To send them notifications about, hey, this many users said that you were not fun to experience this game with. Or, hey, we're, we're gonna ban you for two days, but in the future, if you wanna be better, you know, this is how you do it. And when you have a system like the karma system or other potential moderating systems, you can give them a path to return to where they were. And I've seen in various online games and in virtual reality, uh, users who simply didn't realize that they were being super negative in a way that was affecting others. Like maybe they had a bad day and they were just taking out their anger on other people and they weren't really reflecting on how that was affecting the people that they were taking it out on. So I think having a rehabilitation path and an atonement path is important because 
we have to give them a chance to, to learn from it and to improve themselves. I mean, everyone makes mistakes. So, by preventing uh, abuse and by having you know, community moderation, by fostering good behavior, you can help create a culture. A culture that you want to have provide support for victims. When a user has been harassed, you want to make sure that they feel very comfortable in the intermercial environment. Or else you'll have the harassers scare away all your main users, and then you'll just get a really toxic environment um, that that can ruin your game. I mean, some some games get a reputation of having really uh, abusive users, and then their community never recovers from that. So it is important to create these tools and to help prevent this abuse from the start, so you don't get a toxic culture that uh, that stays within your community. Obviously, you know, admonishing users uh, by banning them is one thing, but also by encouraging a culture that calls them out, that says, hey, that's not cool. Now, having community moderators is really helpful with this because even if they don't have tools to ban users themselves, they can act as, um, as people who inform of users when they're acting inappropriately, who help provide support to the people who are being abused, and help encourage reflection. Now, I think that it's really important to take anyone who is being um, a negative influence on your community and to at least inform them of why they're being a negative influence and to encourage them to reflect on how they can improve themselves. In, in MOBAs, um, there can be a lot of uh, abuse. Um, I'm talking about like League of Legends, uh, Defense of the Ancients 2. These can be really toxic communities, and uh, they have found that after a game, if you ask the person to rate their team's uh, coordination, you know, their team's friendliness, you know, that doesn't really help them improve. Uh, but if you ask them to rate their team's coordination and cooperativeness, and then you ask them to, to rate their own, they see a significant improvement of overall behavior across games that if people after the game are asked to consider, hey, did you act appropriately with your team? Were you supporting teamwork? That they consider that going into their next games and actually are less likely to be abusive or to not work with their team. And so encouraging this reflection, uh, you know, either just through simple questions, uh, can be really helpful in, in creating a culture that is supportive and that, uh, that isn't abusive. So. Let's do a quick review. Uh, we're not, we do not want to limit freedom uh, in exchange for safety. Obviously, there's going to be trade-offs. Obviously, it depends on your experience, uh, the you know, maturity level of your experience, the, the interactions you want to have between users. But it is good to consider what those trade-offs are and to understand how much freedom you want to give your community. I prefer going on the, the side of freedom and, and helping prevent your culture instead. We have ICE which is inform your user of the experiences that they're about to get, consider what experiences might be traumatic to them, and let them know that they have an escape. With the personal moderation tools, like our badge system, like personal bubbles, we have community moderation from uh, volunteers or from out just outstanding members of the community. You have to watch out for abuse of these systems and uh, foster culture against this, and encourage reflection of all users so that they make sure that they are interacting well and that they continue to foster a environment which, um, which is abuse free. So, uh, that's, that's my talk. Let me know if you have any questions. Um, and, and thank you for your time.